Hello, and welcome to another episode of the William Branham Historical Research Podcast. I'm your host, John Collins, the author and founder of William Branham Historical Research at william-branham.org. And with me, I have my very special guest, Melissa Ray, former message believer. Melissa, it's so good to have you, and I'm so glad that you decided to share your story with us. <clears throat> I know our guests, our, our listeners are going to be very excited to hear your story as well. So I thought maybe if you could just tell us a little bit about yourself and, you know, a brief overview of your history in the message. My name is Melissa Ray. I'm uh, recently was started in the message when I was 12 um, is when my parents um, joined the message. And I was in the message until I was early 30s. Um, and uh, I've now been out of the message for almost 20 years, but there's still a lot of lingering issues that I didn't realize that I was still dealing with. Um, I'm now a divorced, uh, registered nurse. I'm a mom of four beautiful children that are grown and, and doing well on their own. And um, figured it was time to go ahead and say some of these things that have been kind of shoved, you know, deep back deep into a recess of my mind for a really, really long time. Well, like I said, it's so good to have you. And from what I understand, you went to some of the churches in the South. And I, uh, I've actually been working with a few different people from Alabama. So I'm excited to meet you and, and hear another story from, uh, from that area. Maybe if you could tell us just a little bit about the church itself, the church that you attended. Um, the church that I attended here was in Alabama was um, a lot of rough things that, that happened here, and, and it was a lot of things that made me reconsider, you know, what what was I doing? Um, you know, and, and, and where I got to the point where I just could not tolerate the, I just couldn't tolerate the way people were treated. Um, I'd had some issues with my husband um, at the time went to the pastor for some counseling, right, um, of my problem. <laughs> and the pastor had a, um, a daughter about my age, um, and her and I did not get along. I um, just, our, our personalities clashed really badly. Um, so I went to the, the pastor, and, and of course his wife was there too, which was appropriate. Um, for some counseling because of course we didn't do therapy because therapy was considered you know you know a, a weakness and you know you're not trusting god to, to to take care of you and 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 you're you know lacking in faith and and all these other things and and relying on on man's medicine instead of relying on god and um so i went to them and told them it was a very um sensitive subject and about two days after I went to them about my problem and what was going on, their daughter called me to counsel me about my problem. Wow. So, and I, that would have been horrendous in, in any church, but for me it was one of the biggest um, betrayals and, and one of the final, that and then the things that were going on with my daughter, um, you know, looking at her and, and thinking, you know, I can't do this. I can't do this to her. I can't do this to another generation. And deciding at that point, you know, that I, I could no longer be in the message. You know, like you said, it's it's horrendous that they did this. And when you go as a message believer to a pastor seeking help, usually you go thinking that what you're saying is private. And in many cases, they're, they're very intimate details of your life that you're sharing with a person who you trust. And then that trust is betrayed either... You know, some people say that even right from behind the pulpit, they will share the very intimate details of their lives right behind the pulpit to the entire church. But it, I find it really odd that so many people, that's, <laughs> that's their first step on the way out is to go to the pastor for help, which is like, it's their one job, right? <clears throat> now, you also, yeah. went, you also went to some churches out west, and I'm extremely interested to hear that because I... Um, there were some churches I attended out west myself, but they were in Arizona. 
but the ones you mm-hmm. attended, I've never actually been to. So I'm really excited to hear more about those. One of my first memories of being in the message was um, before we actually moved to Rapid City, I, I was born in Oregon. Um, and my dad, it was Easter Sunday, and my dad made us sit in the car while all the other children at church did their Easter egg hunt. All the other years we were able to go and, and do the thing. And, and um, it, wasn't even, it wasn't even a real church. It was like a, a lodge, and they had a big church. They had a big Sunday, Easter Sunday service, and then they did the, you know, the Easter egg hunt and everything. That's one of my earliest memories of the message. And we sat in the car, and I remember my mom was so angry at him for doing that to us girls. From, you know, we were all dressed in our Easter, East, pretty Easter dresses. And I remember my mom being very upset at him for that because um, she hadn't quite accepted everything. It was all still really new. Um, and then after that, we did go to um, South Dakota. And um, not only was I, you know, immersed in the church there, but um, we went to um, a private school that was run by the church there as well. Um, so I was completely encapsulated from any kind of, you know, outward influences um, at that time. Um, a church in Rapid City was, uh, they were, um, they were Joseph believers, real big. Um, matter of fact, Joseph uh, came to visit. Um, his picture was hung up in the church right next to Brother Branham's. Oh, God. Wow, I haven't called him that in years. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, uh, so it was, you know, we had the, you know, the, the, the picture of, of Branham with the, the pillar of fire on, on one side and the picture of Joseph standing next to, I think it was the one with him standing next to his dad. That was over on the other side. And then, of course, Hoffman's head of Christ was in the center. You know, because we we have to have white Jesus there too. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, you know the the pastor there, um, they started in the church there. You know, the church had been established for for quite a while, but it was all, um, you know, I, I really think it was a bunch of hippies that just didn't know. They they just they they kind of were lost and were looking for answers, and they all kind of ended up coming together and and they have some great amazing stories there was a huge flood and god saved them from the flood in this upper room of this building they were in and and all these amazing stories and um all i could remember is that they were really big on teaching that the rapture was coming any moment you know any moment any moment any moment and i kept on thinking boy i would really hate for the rapture to come and i haven't had a chance to grow up yet I hadn't yeah. had a chance to be married. I hadn't had a chance to experience any of these things, but, um, you know, I wonder if that's also, you know, uh, an experience of a lot of other young people did when they started in the message from an early age. You know, you always think that, you know, you're not going to get beyond the next year, you know, let alone the next 10 years. And um, purity culture, of course, is something that was real big in the late eighties and early nineties, just in evangelical culture. Um, but it seemed in the message, it was, it was just beyond, um, beyond even what the evangelicals taught. Um, so us girls were taught from a very early age that, that, um, we were to dress appropriately, um, not show our knees. We, we didn't wear open toed shoes. We didn't wear makeup. We didn't cut our hair. Um, all, all of these things, because if we did, we would cause men to stumble if they were to look at us in a wrong manner. We would cause men to stumble, and we would be responsible for sending them to hell. Um, and at 12 and 13, it wasn't just, they weren't just talking about other boys my age. They were talking about grown men looking at me as wow. a young, you know, developing female that I, I had to cover myself because of grown men, not just because of boys my age. And um, I always wondered why they didn't have to be responsible for themselves. And that was yeah. something that um, I was just told not to ask. Um, yeah. You know, the rapture, end of days, doomsday theology that the cult teaches, 
I remember the night and day difference from being in it, and then it took a long time to to kind of unravel that in my head and then wake up. But then it suddenly dawned on me, as children, it's entirely different than adults because as an adult, you're thinking, you know, you're you're not really thinking in the way of a child. Like you said, you want to live your life as a child. You're not, <laughs> you're really, you're not thinking yeah. of the end of days. You, you could care less about the end of days. You would rather play with your friends. And while in the cult mindset, you know, you're taught to think, well, this is a good thing. The world is ending and Jesus is coming, which most most churches do, but the emphasis is backwards. The emphasis in the cult is the doomsday. It's not the happiness that comes. And as a child, they really, it's like they rob you of your happiness. Not not just your happiness, but they, they rob you of any hope of the future. You know, because you don't plan on going to college. You don't plan on having children. You don't plan on what you're going to do with your life eventually because there isn't going to be one. You're going to be in heaven and everything's going to be wonderful if you, of course, you're going to be in heaven if you do A, B, C, D, and E, and, you know, yeah. the entire alphabet correctly. Um, and if, if, you, if, you, if you screw up or, you know, get caught kissing a boy in a parking lot, um, you know, and you find out about it later, you're just going to go to hell. And that's just the way it is. <laughs> um, you know, uh, and uh, <laughs> um, you're not taught, you're not taught how to, how to live as a, a human. You're not, you're not taught anything other than obey the rules or you're going to suffer forever. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I, it really I messes laughed. up your psyche as a kid. <laughs> yeah. I laughed when you said it because I'm one of the few men that my first kiss was actually my wife on our wedding day. And uh -huh. I, I'll never forget it because, I, you know, in the, in the, quote, royalty circles that I was in, I got to know uh -huh. all of the people who are of the upper status, and I never forget. I can't remember who it was that said it, but they were they were talking about this, and <laughs> they even asked me specifically, okay, so how many girls have you kissed? And they were, like, shocked that I had not kissed any other girls, but I was <laughs> shocked that they were saying this because that was one of the rules, man. You didn't do this, or you're going yeah, straight you to hell. And um, they, there was this joke made that not a single man obeys this rule, and I'm like, what religion are you guys in? <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, it's it's funny that you kind of bring that up because it, it I don't I'm not sure exactly how to how to put that. I, I went to a small Christian school. Um and we were taught that, you know, as you know, there there was there was more girls than there were boys. Um and um the part where I got caught kissing the boy in the, in the parking lot at school, that was the one year I went to public school. And um, that was my year of rebellion, I guess we're going to say. Um, and I got caught by my aunt. And we, mom wasn't even going to tell dad. She knew it was just going to cause a bunch of trouble. And, and she was just like, okay, you're never going to see this boy again. You're, you're, you're not going to be going to, you know, school's almost over for the year. You're just never going to see this boy again. You're not going to be in a situation where you can. And, um, and then my aunt tells her best friend who happens to be the pastor's daughter, who told the pastor, who told my dad, who happens to be, a, who happened to be a deacon. And dad was very very angry i remember waking up to him sitting on my bed and he had um he had smacked me across the face i was 16 called me a slut and a whore and um and i didn't stop seeing that boy <laughs> <laughs> um so so you know i mean that it was but that was more out of um out of anger that it wasn't that I mean, it wasn't that boy's fault in any way whatsoever. He was a nice boy, um, and he wasn't raised the same way I was. It was more of a, I'm tired of you telling me that I can't do A, B, C, or D, but then not everybody has to follow those same rules. So I'm going to back up just a little bit. Like I said, I went to the, um, the, the Christian school, and in that Christian school, there were boys there, and I was... Um, 
I was a you know a, a deacon's daughter, and my um, my mom taught at the school, and you know I was one of the good girls and didn't do anything wrong. And and I I remember trying so hard to make sure that I was I was correct in my conversation when I was talking to boys and correct in 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 what I was wearing. And and we didn't go you know we didn't go swimming with boys, and we were we wore these huge culottes you know for for gym class, and you know we didn't you know, intermingle, yet at any time I would have a conversation with young boys, you know, 13, 14, 15, those conversations always turned sexual, even though it wasn't what I was trying to do. And I kept on thinking, why is it that I'm doing all the things right? And yet, what am I doing wrong to where these boys don't respect me the way I'm told would happen if I did everything right, that the, that these boys would treat me with respect and treat me with um, you know, and, and honor and honor and honor me because of, you know, because I'm doing these things right. I'm, I'm being modest. I'm being pure. I'm, I'm acting correctly. Then why is it anytime I have, you know, anytime any of these boys and I were alone, these in, you know, even if it's just like after school in a parking lot, sitting in a car, just visiting, you know, there's other people around and everything, but it may, it may be a conversation where maybe not everybody could hear but they start talking, they start talking dirty. And it's like, well, because they are boys that have hormones raging and they're not taught to regulate those. They're not taught how to handle themselves. They're taught that the girls have to do all that. Right. And I remember hating feeling that that was all my responsibility. And yet, even, even when I was the one acting correctly, I was still being treated in a way that was disrespectful. And I always kept on thinking, what am I doing wrong? Why am I not quite doing it right? And, um, but I never could go talk to anybody about it because then we would just get in trouble because we were having conversations we shouldn't be having. And um, it really wasn't the boys' fault either because they weren't taught. They weren't taught that they had to. They weren't even taught what those, what those hormones and those emotions and those, those feelings were. They were just told that the girls had to cover up so you didn't look at them. <laughs> <laughs> it's always the um, girl's fault. <laughs> yeah, and and at least that was my that was my that was my frame of of reference um in our youth group. Um I'd even been told by some of the older boys that I had to practice the act of submission as far as how I was talking to them and how I was how I was acting around them so that I would be prepared for a husband when I when I when the time came. That I had to practice talking and acting submissive towards <laughs> towards these, these these boys that are a couple years older than me <laughs> that um you know i had no um there was no reason whatsoever that i should do anything even i mean yeah they had no no right to expect that of me in any way whatsoever but we were taught that women are supposed to submit to men and and um and he thought it would be a good idea to tell to tell me that i needed to practice I never really thought about that until I think it was our podcast with Naomi Wright. She was talking about <clears throat> how, you know, you're in, in this weird thing and the women aren't, like you said, they aren't respected, but more than that, they're, I, I don't know what the word is. They're, they're treated in such a way that they're, they're just there. It's the religion is for the men and the women are just off to the side. But then what happens is because of that dynamic, the women start to feel like they're being groomed for the men because they're le so much less in status than the men that they feel like cattle being being led to the slaughter of marriage. <laughs> I wanted to go to college. I had the grades for it. I was smart enough. I um, wasn't sure what I wanted to do, but that was nipped in the bud really quick because um, I might actually learn things and <laughs> and get ideas and um and everything and and so instead we um kind of a, my later teen years my uh, 11th and 12th grade i'd end up going to a um for my 11th grade year i end up going to a, a a public school just because of the circumstances um of my dad's job and and some other things that were going on but um they really didn't have anything to do with the church they were just about about life in general um and um that was actually the year that I actually did start thinking of that there was a life beyond, you know, what was afforded to me in the message. Um, 
and I did things like I, I got a job um, waitressing. Um, several things. I, I tried getting a job at another, um, at some other places, but then they wanted me to work Sundays, and that was that was not going to happen. Um, so I had to go, you know, back to back to my other jobs. And I remember <laughs> testifying in church that uh, about losing my job because I I um, I felt that I had to to be there to to my place was to be in church on Sunday instead of being you know at the job and they were insisting that I work Sundays. I, I remember that vividly. <laughs> It sounds like there were some differences between some of the sects that I had experienced in yours. For instance, in the main sect, there are churches that don't even allow women to wear culottes, and it sounds like you did. There are also churches in the main sect where women are strongly forbidden to get a job. So how was that dynamic? Were they like were they accepting of the fact that you got a job, or was this— outside of their control i was still i was still a teenager so i was still considered a child um and not married and so to them that was a little bit different um and i i didn't seem nobody said anything about me having a job um and the, the culottes um those were made by the ladies in the church just for pe class for the school that we went to oh okay. um and, because it was a school you know, requirement because, it was a school requirement, yeah. And, you know, they had to teach, because of the state of South Dakota, in order to be a school, they had to teach a certain amount of physical education. And so in order to meet those requirements, they had to find a way for us girls to participate in PE class and still do it modestly. So culottes was the, was gotcha. the thing. But it was strictly separated boys and girls. And, um, um, but we, I think that, I don't think that we were quite as as conservative as some of the other sects, um, you know, cause there are some things, um, you know, we, we didn't, you know, we didn't wear makeup. We didn't cut our hair. We didn't, um, wear shoe polish, no, no open toed shoes. We didn't, um, we didn't show our shoulders. Um, but we were allowed to do things like, um, you know, the women in the church like played piano and I played the organ. So we were able to participate as far as that was concerned. We were able to sing church. Um, I sang with my dad for Easter Sunday service at the Branham Tabernacle one year, um, which was an experience. Um, <laughs> and my grandfather but, probably um, said, thank you, sister, for that number. <laughs> that, was, that was his catch line <laughs> after remember. every song. <laughs> I, I don't remember. I know it was just uh, me and my, my two sisters and, and my dad, and we sang it as well. And my dad played the guitar. And I, I, don't, I, was, I was young. I don't remember... Uh, much more than that, but um, so so actually having a job really didn't. I didn't really ask anybody, um, and and the pastor never really said a whole lot about it. Um, it didn't seem to be a problem. We weren't forbidden to have a job. Um, the women in the church, um, a lot of them had jobs surrounding the school. Um, you know, so they were like, you know, they were teachers, they were custodians, they were. You know, they, they worked for the school. A lot of them, my mom worked at the school so that, um, so that we would get, we were able to go for free. So we didn't have to pay the tuition um, because my mom worked instead, which I'm pretty sure that that, you know, there was some labor laws <laughs> broken in that, but um, that's just, it's just the way it was. Um, but that led us to, you know, eventually who were we going to marry? My sister married one of the, um, of the boys in the church. Um, and there really wasn't a whole lot of, of options. Um, and then we found out about this thing called um, Louisiana Church Camp. And uh, it was the Easter Sunday. Um, it was the Easter, Easter weekend. And I got it because I, I wanted to go and um, had the opportunity to go. And me and my older sister, were gonna, we, we flew down and went. And we got in a lot of trouble because it was a... It was a different sect. They didn't believe in Joseph. And um, <laughs> and we did that instead of going to Jeffersonville for Easter. And, yeah. and we got, we did, it was the, did you really make a wise choice? Did you make a choice based on what, what Brother Brandon would want you to do? And, uh, um, and Louisiana camp was where I met my husband. 
You know, I back then I would have envied you. Now, in hindsight, I'm I'm actually kind of glad of this. But I was never allowed to go to these camps as a <laughs> Collins, and you know, and we're in the, uh-huh. in the main sect in Jeffersonville. These things were evil by my family. Now, there were other people in Jeffersonville at the Branham Tabernacle that went to them, but for us, man, we <laughs> we actually. I hate to say it, but we actually looked down on people who went to these camps because we thought that these camps were just unruly, vile places. And now I look at the videos and I'm like, man, I'm so glad I wasn't allowed to go to these things. Oh, <laughs> you know, the the best part about it was getting to go and meet with other kids, just yeah. getting to go meet other faces. And, and, you know, and that part was fun. You know, they had fun activities and, you know, games. And in Louisiana, we learned how to eat crawfish because that was amazing. And, you know, I'm from South Dakota, right? And we went down to Louisiana. It's already spring in Louisiana. We still had snow up in South Dakota. So that alone was an amazing reason to go. (laughs) Um, But basically what they were, just big marriage marts. Yeah. And I'm completely convinced of that. Um, Of course, there were the the hours long um, services within the prayer lines and and all of these things, and um, and you know, you you talk about how um, being being Jefferson uh, Jeffersonville royalty, um, you were kind of, you know, looked down on the on the they 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 didn't talk too nice about Jeffersonville either. <laughs> oh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing, and and I always thought, you know, why can't everybody just get along? And it's like, well, no, well, they believe in the seven thunders, and they believe in this, and they believe in Joseph, and they believe in this, and. Um, when when we came down there and we realized that we were one of those those the, those Joseph believers, um, then we kind of we kind of stayed quiet about that because you know it it really um they kind of looked at us funny. Um, but I remember when um, when the Arizona group showed up, they looked perfect. They all had the same haircut and they all or not haircut hairstyle. Yeah. And they all had the same dresses and everybody looked just. And, and years later, I went and visited um, um, Tucson and, and met them there, and they were all so um, normal. And and but but when I was a kid, it was like it was like they're from this huge church, and they go to the they go to Tucson, where Brother Brown spent so much time and preached so much, and he talks about Arizona like it's the most magical place on earth, and. And these people live there. And, and to me, that was an amazing thing. Part of the reason why the Collins family didn't like this is because there were so many different beliefs and different sects. And they were all coming together in harmony, so, quote unquote harmony. And, um, you know, the cult is like this big Baskin Robbins 31 flavors where none of the flavors mix. <laughs> it's, it's this really, yeah. really weird religion. So I'm, I'm curious to know more about the marriage because... From our perspective, we there's no way if you had have sent me to this thing, if I was forced to go as as a Collins in this religion, I would have never even dreamed of choosing somebody to marry there because they're in this thing. So what was what was it like getting married after going to one of these camp meetings? I don't remember asking permission of my pastor to marry someone who didn't have the same wasn't from the same sect. Um, but truthfully, I think it was because of the situation that um, my ex-husband's family was in. They weren't really in a, um, in a set church. Um, his, his dad had died um, and his mom was raising all 12 of those children on her own. Um, they just happened to be in Oklahoma. They didn't have a, a local church close by. And so she actually bounced around to different churches in the in the Arkansas Oklahoma area there, um, and didn't have um, a real set church. Um, and she didn't really believe in just one sect or the other. She believed in the message, and that coming from a Mennonite background herself into the message, all of it was um, was foreign to her. Um, you know, and they they'd been in the message. They got they actually got kicked out of the Mennonite religion and their family. Um, because they bought a car um, after they got married. Um, and then they hadn't really found or been in the message very long when he died. He died in 82. And they had been in the me- message maybe a year or two. Um, and so she was kind of, um, she'd had a, a pastor tell her that since her husband had died um, and she was a widow, that he was going to be technically be 
her spiritual husband and her spiritual head and tell her how to take care of her children and, and take care of her family and, and, and take care of her money and everything else. And she's like, no, I'm not having anything of that. And she left, um, which, you know, I, I mean, kudos to her. That's great that she, she managed to do that, you know, to, to tell him that she wasn't going to, you know, be under his rule like that. And um, I always kind of applauded her for that because that took guts. Um, so I think that was why um, it was okay um, for them, for, for me to marry who I did was because it wasn't that he was from some, you know, some big, big mainstream church that, that, you know, was, you know, part of the, you know, one of the other sex. Um, so I think I, I, if that answers your question, that's kind of, that's kind of how it went. And, and he, we moved to, or he moved from Oklahoma to, to Rapid City, um, about six months before we got married. Um, and we stayed there for almost a year. Um, after we got married and we got married in the church there. So I think that's part of why, because I kind of brought him into our fold instead of me going out. And um, so I think that's why it was okay. So we have an unusual connection that honestly, until this call today, I had no idea that we had, but you knew you, you actually married somebody from my past. Um, as you know, I went to churches from South Carolina to Arizona and everywhere in between. And, one of them in between, there was a family that I met. I, I won't mention the name. Obviously, we'll keep the names out of it. But there was a family that I knew, and um, I saw – actually, I, I met them several times in our own – they weren't nearly so big as what you what you consider your camp that you went to, the Louisiana camps. But they would have these dinners on the ground in the middle of the hills of the Ozark Mountains – and um, I, I met your husband for the first time, and he, uh, you know, I, I don't know that much about him other than he seemed like a nice guy at the time. Um, maybe tell us a little bit about your marriage and how that went. I'm, I'm trying to picture taking somebody from one sect into another, how the dynamics would be if you were to do that in the message. We'd met that first time in at Louisiana camp, and then the next year at Louisiana camp, we kind of reconnected. Um, and um, we, we, we chit-chatted and talked to each other that entire weekend. And, um, and then we kind of dated long distance, you know, just with, with back then it was phone calls, you know. Uh, there, wasn't any, there wasn't any text messaging or, <laughs> or Facebook or anything. Um, and um, so we dated long distance for, I guess, about, about a year. And then went down to Louisiana camp again. And on the way back from Louisiana camp that year is when he asked me to marry him. Um, and then that was in April and we got married in October of that year. So um, I guess in June of that year, he moved up to um, up to Rapid City and um, kind of came into to our church there. Um, so I guess, you know, like I was, you know, like I'd said, it was more that, the, the fact that he had gone to another church and I, and I, I kind of, uh, like I said, pulled him into, into our church, um, kind of made it okay in the eyes of my, my pastor after he met, after he met him and, and everything else. Um, and so we got married, um, within, within six months of, of being engaged. Um, and I don't know if this was the experience of a lot of message girls. I just know it was my experience, um, that even though you're, that you're technically once you get engaged you're technically married and and if you become unengaged you can't marry anyone else um i don't know if that was a widespread thing but for our church it was you know once you were engaged you were married um but we still had to keep ourselves pure for you know for our wedding night that was very common you it's almost like you don't need the wedding, right? In the message, you get engaged and mm -hmm. that's it, you're married. <laughs> but that's yeah. that is a very common belief oh. among all of the sects. Right. Only, only there was no, there was not supposed to still, I mean, we weren't even really allowed to be alone with each other very often. You know, I mean, then I was supposed to just, just marry him and be, you know, be alone with him all the time at that point. Um, but, you know, he kept, you know, he's a, you know, we were 18, 19. Um, and he was, um, let's just say he was very eager to get married, <laughs> just put it that way. Um, and I kept on having to tell him no. You know, look, it's it's 
we're getting married in just a couple of weeks. You know, we're getting married in a couple of days. No, you know, and once we get married, I won't tell you no anymore. Um, two weeks before or a week before our wedding, um, I had let him know at every single point everything about about the wedding itself because this was my big party and boy I was planned to you know to every little detail and I had found a vintage dress in a um in a consignment shop and it it fit me perfectly it was had you know long full sleeves it was up to the you know up to my you know my my chin with the collar and beautiful beautiful lace embroidery but the only thing was it was it was off white it wasn't pure bright white and because of that, and there was no changing the color because it was, it was antique lace. You know, you can't, you can't bleach antique lace without it falling apart. Um, but I love this dress. And so what I did was I made sure that every single little aspect of everything else, any other, any other, anything else that had any kind of white in it had to be, um, had to be off white. So it didn't show that my dress wasn't pure white. And he was aware of all this from the very beginning. Um, and so it was his mom. Everybody had, you know, he hadn't seen the dress, but his, his mom had. And he came to me and he goes, my mom wanted me to ask why your dress is not pure white. And I'm like, well, you know, because uh, this is the dress I found and this is the color it was when I found it. And I really like this dress and, and I'm, I've worked really hard to, you know, to make this dress, you know, look really good for, for all of this. And. And he's like, yes, but she's she's concerned that maybe there was some things that happened prior to us getting engaged that you need to tell me about before we get married because you chose to have a cream colored dress or an off white dress. So basically, a week before my wedding, my this man of my dreams and love of my life was basically letting his mom insinuate that I was a whore. Wow. Um, I didn't tell anybody. I just looked at him and I said, no, I said, you know, I won't even, I've been telling, you no, all of this time from, from, from the, the minute we got engaged, I've been telling, you no. why would I do something with someone else prior to our getting engaged and then tell, you no during all this time prior to our wedding, why would I do that? Um, and I remember it just, it, it, it broke a little something in me. It, it just, it, it went back to the, am I really, you know, maybe I'm not. Maybe, maybe I'm not adequate. Maybe I'm not enough. Maybe, maybe there's something in me that is, that is sinful or is wrong. And, and I did a lot of soul searching and was in my Bible and trying to figure out what it is that was wrong with me to where I would pick a dress that wasn't completely white. Um, we got married. Um, and because things didn't happen the way he expected them to on the wedding night. He once again accused me of doing things with other people prior to our wedding. And at that point I couldn't, you know, what, what would I do? You know, I mean, it's like, well, are you, are we going to stay married or, or, or what? That's terrible. And one of the things in the message that if you're a listener and you've never been in this thing, <clears throat> once you get engaged, you're married. Well, once you are married, you're stuck. You can like, as a woman, there are some sex you're not even allowed to <clears throat> to break off the wedding to separate if you do you can never get married again obviously in this type of religion so <clears throat> i'm sure that you probably felt trapped if you were going through this at that time especially on you know that that soon after your wedding i felt betrayed i felt like you know i had been trying to do everything right and yet still yet still i was told that i wasn't good enough that it wasn't enough. Um, and whether or not that was his upbringing, the message, or just his personality, um, you know, I don't know that we'll ever know it, whether, you know, that's that, you know, that's the whole nurture and, and nurture um, argument, you know, is it, is it because of, you know, the way he was born? Is, was, he, was he born that way? Or was it because of his upbringing? Um, or because of, you know, the narcissistic family that he was raised in, you know, I, you know, I, I don't, I don't know. And I, and I look back on it now and, um, a part of me cries for that young girl <laughs> for what she went through. And I, and I think, I think how, 
how did I stand that? And I didn't tell anybody. Um, not even my mom and dad. Um, I didn't have, who could I tell? You know, who, who could I tell that I was being um, accused of being impure by the one person that I thought was going to protect me for my entire life? Um, and his mother. <laughs> um, they did, I did tell them later on, you know, what had happened. And my mom was, my mom was enraged. <laughs> um, but this was years later before I told them. And there was nothing at that time that she could do about it. Um, anyway, I, uh, my mom and dad were going to go to, uh, we're going to go to Oregon for a visit. And I was pregnant early, um, early on. Um, it was um, three or four months along, just, just early stage uh, pregnancy with my first, my first son. And um, my, my ex-husband was working out of town. Um, you know, because it was, it was summertime and, um, um, that was when, you know, the work was. And, and so he would be gone for a couple of weeks at a time. And they said, well, why don't you just come with us out to Oregon? You know, you can see grandma and, and do all these things. And so I was like, yeah, sure. I, you know, I'd love to do that. And, it, and my ex was like, yeah, sure. That's great. You know, uh, why don't you go do that's a good opportunity. And so I went and when we got back, um, he wasn't home. We couldn't find him. He knew we were coming home. Couldn't find him anywhere. Um, and he had been out. He'd been out running around. Um, he swears up and down that he wasn't with anyone else at the time. Um, but I, here I was pregnant and married and nothing really that I could do about it if he was. Um, because it was just not, once you're married, it, that's just the way it is. Um, and I tried to believe the best of it. And continued on. Um, fast forward a little bit. Um, was um, two children in. <laughs> um, my son, um, my second son, had was already born, and we were actually living in in Texas at the time. We um, we couldn't find any work in. Um, in South Dakota, and we were just having a hard time making ends meet. And so my dad and mom had moved from South Dakota at that time. It's kind of how we, we uh, made it down to the South. Um, and we, um, my dad worked industrial maintenance, um, uh, and or not maintenance, but industrial construction. So he would move around a lot, you know, doing, um, doing big, uh, putting in big machinery and building, building big plants and stuff. Um, and so he invited my, um, my ex-husband to come work with him. And so we did that and we traveled in a, in a, uh, a travel trailer for a couple of years. Um, and we ended up in, in Texas. Um, I had two kids under the age of three. <laughs> um, and that was the first time that he cheated on me. Um, I was at his mom's in Oklahoma. I had taken the boys to go, to go visit her. And um, he calls me and says that he's sick with the flu and I need to come home. And so I get my stuff together and I rush home and he's in, he's, he's laying in bed crying and I'm like, you know, what's wrong? Are you okay? And, and all of these things. And then he starts to tell me that, um, that this, that this woman had come over and he, um, in a moment of weakness, allowed her to come in and they proceeded to, um, uh, to be together, I guess. Um, and then she left. Um, I was shocked. Um, I really just didn't know what to say, but as I'm processing this, the next words out of his mouth <laughs> were that it was my fault because I obviously wasn't meeting his needs as a wife should for her husband. Two children under the age of three, <laughs> um, but I wasn't. I wasn't meeting his needs, um, and that's why he, in a moment of weakness, was able to go and be tempted by somebody else. In a religion where the men are somewhat indoctrinated to believe that everything is the woman's fault. In fact, there are quotes if you listen to William Branham's sermons where he says ninety percent of every crime is caused because of a woman committing it or. A woman is behind it, he says. It's 
It's not hard to believe that a man would think this way, and as a male myself, I didn't have it to that degree, but I had it to the extent that I really felt like there were things that the women did to, well, he said that the women were the deceivers. They were created by Satan to deceive. So this indoctrination creates problems, but it sounds like the problems that are created for you were much worse than some. Well, in, in, and even for him, it, was, it wasn't that he messed up or he made the mistake. That woman tempted him. So it was even, even that woman that came in, it was her fault. Right. Because, you know, she, she seduced him, you know, and then it was my fault. She, w- she would not have been able to seduce him if I had been caring for his needs. So in neither of those, in that entire thing, he didn't take any of the blame for any of it. Yeah, um, no and whether, like I said, whether that was indoctrination or whether that was, um, I tend to believe that it's probably a little bit of both indoctrination, maybe, um, fed into the, the, the narcissism or one, one or the other, I, you know, I, I think it all kind of, kind of worked together. Um, but then once again, I was, you know, I'm still stuck and not only am I stuck because I'm, I'm in Texas, there's. There's a church there. There was a church there in Dallas. Um, and I and I went, we went to the one, well, it was in Fort Worth. Um, we went to that one a couple of times. Um, and I remember talking to that pastor there about um, a few little things, like little things that, um, that you know, were, were causing some turmoil, you know, in my marriage. I didn't talk to him about the, the you know, the, the, the cheating or anything like that because I, I just was too... I, I couldn't, um, but a few other things. And, and, you know, once again, it was like, well, you need to get into your Bible. You need to pray. You need to look at, uh, you know, the Proverbs 31 and, and be a sweet, a sweet soul and, and, and all of these things. And, and your husband will act appropriately. If, if I, if I fix what's wrong in me, then he will act appropriately. And, um, I heard that a lot. I heard anytime I would go to any pastor, you know, just, crying and begging for help in, in, in the marriage that I was in, it was always, well, you need to pray harder. You need to get into the word. You need to listen to more tapes here. Listen to this tape. He's got a lot of interest. He's got a lot of things on this about marriage and, you know, um, you know, you know, pray more, you know, get into your Bible more, all of these things. It was never, it was never, no, your ex-husband is doing things that are wrong and he should not be doing those things. And I will talk to him and we will talk to him about, you know, his behavior is wrong. It was never that. It was always that I needed to pray more. I needed to fix what was wrong with me um, in order in order for him to change. Because if I was sweet and, and holy and, and a good wife, then... Um, then all those other things would click into place. I tried for 29 years. None of those things clicked into place. And marriage counseling in the cult is not only taboo in a lot of sects, it's probably forbidden. I'm assuming it was in the sect that you were in. Um, it was. It was something that we didn't even think about. And um, it wasn't until we'd gone, we did try marriage counseling once, but that was mostly as we were already on our way out of the message that because you know I stayed I stayed with him even after we left the message um, and there was a lot of there was a lot of turmoil um, that infidelity led to us having an arrangement of having an open marriage um, and it went kind of like this we would meet and go to parties and on you know friday and saturday night we'd go to parties and we'd meet other couples and i would entertain the male part of the other couple so that he could enjoy himself with the female part of the couple and if you have to edit edit any of that out just let me know but then sunday morning i was expected to put my dress back on and wipe off my makeup and um put my hair right and look the part of the perfect message girl and go to church. That's terrible. (laughs) And I went along with it. I went along with it because I was searching for any way I could to make him happy. 
and nothing I was doing. I was exhausted. I, I had two little children and it wasn't much longer after that, that, that I was pregnant with a third. And um, I remember when we moved here or when we moved here to Alabama, we moved here in 98 and we had, we considered moving to Louisiana. We couldn't find work and we couldn't find a, a, a place that we liked there. And so we ended up moving to, um, uh, to Alabama, to the, the church here in Ohatchee. That was in 1998. Um, he found a, a good job here. Um, we liked the church. Um, and, and during all of this time, there was still this shadow part of our lives that nobody else knew about, right? The, the, the partying and the, the makeup and the drinking and the, all of these other things, right? And, and the meeting with other couples and nobody knew about that, right? But on the outside, we still look like the perfect message couple. Um, we moved here to Alabama and I begged him. I begged him to make this be a new start and to stop the seeing other people, stop the, the, the open marriage part of it. I begged him. Um, and he told me no. <laughs> he told me he couldn't, he couldn't let it go. Um, and that's when the, the physical abuse started. Um, there were horrible, horrible fights. Um, by then I had four children. Two, my, my two youngest children were born here in, in Alabama. Um, horrible knockout, just, just horrible fights. He um, would lock me in, lock me in the closet. Um, he would, um, there was a, a time that he, um, I was, I was in the shower and he would turn cold water on me um, because I wasn't responding the way he thought I should respond. He wasn't saying the things, or I wasn't making him feel right about whatever infraction I had done. And he kept turning the cold water on me until I some, I, I don't know, it, it lasted, it felt like in my mind it lasted forever. Um, and I was desperate for help. Um, and that's when I went to my, um, I went to my pastor because I was this, this dichotomy of the of the the fighting and the the um, and still going to the parties and and doing all of that and 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 the thing is that this the hard thing is I enjoyed the parties I enjoyed the attention from other people I enjoyed the forgetting that my life was really a horrible mess I enjoyed that time of where I would, I, you know, I would, I would drink and, and all of these things. And I could forget, I could forget for a while and I could enjoy being someone else for a little bit. Um, but then if I, if I enjoyed too much, I would pay for it um, the next day um, or the next week. And he would find some way to make me repay him for the fun that I had. Um, but nobody knew, nobody knew about the, the verbal abuse and the mental abuse and the, um, and all the rest of it. He was, he was the perfect Christian message husband. He didn't do any of those. He didn't do anything wrong. Um, he went to church with me on Sunday and he took such good care of our kids and he was, he was a good, hardworking man, and and I was dying. I, I there was a point where I was um, I was suicidal. Um, I thought about ramming my car into into a tree over and over and over again on the way home many times. Um, from whether it was I'd gone to the store to get groceries, and it was never never when I was in the car with my children ever. Um, but if I was in the car alone, I would have, it was, took everything in me to continue to get the car home safely. Um, and like you mentioned before, therapy was very, very hard frowned upon. Um, and I was desperate. I didn't know what to do. I would talk to my parents and my mom and dad didn't really know what to do either. They were like, well, if you're not willing to leave, which they offered me a safe place, they did. But they didn't know about about the the open marriage part. They just knew about the fighting and the and the 
I don't think they knew the extent of how bad it was, but they knew about the fighting. And they offered me a safe place. And they said that, um, that I could always come home. Um, but I had to be willing to let him go. And it was ingrained in me that you don't do that. And I had to keep on trying. And, and um, any time that I talked about how horrible things were, he'd be like, well, you just haven't tried enough. You're just going to give up. And um, then I would try some more. I would try harder. I would read my Bible more and I would pray more. And I would, I would say, okay, I'm just going to, we're not going to go, we're not going to go to the parties anymore. We're not going to do that anymore. And he would, next time one came up, it was like, well, we're going to go again. And um, um, I finally went to my pastor with the whole story um, that and that was that was when a couple days after that his um, his daughter called me to counsel me about my issue about my problem. I shut down. I, I completely shut down at that point. Uh, the betrayal I felt was astronomical because I had thought I had been going the right direction to talk to my pastor about about an issue, um, and that I thought, well, maybe I was going to get some help. And I got betrayed instead. Um, and mixing that up with, um, you know, the, the fact that, that my daughter started, um, I had to start making her wear dresses. She was at that age. And, um, and I, couldn't, I couldn't do that to her. And so that's, that, was, that was the start of my out. That was the start of me leaving. Um, uh, the message part anyway. And I really did feel betrayed from something that I had, I had believed for so long and had, had tried to do everything so right for so long, even back when I was a, when I was a young girl and remembering to, to, to dress correctly and dress appropriately. And yet still these boys would talk to me inappropriately to, you know, to keeping myself, you know, yes, there were, there was, um, there were two other boys that I had kissed prior to um, to my marriage, and those were confessed prior to the marriage, right? And um, I'd kept myself for my marriage. And then all the way through all of that, I still kept, even though we were, there was a lot of other things going on, I was still trying to do everything right as best I could. Um, and it was it was pure survival mode from what I'm when I look back now at it, it was it was survival. And kissing is, I know it's not in the message, so <clears throat> I'll get hate mail for saying this, but kissing is such a small thing <laughs> in the grand scheme of things. Uh, you're one of the first person, you are the first person, actually, that I've got on record. I've actually been trying to find somebody who gave a testimony like yours, because believe it or not, your testimony is not unique. We, you and I actually haven't had this discussion, so you're hearing it now for the first time. <laughs> <clears throat> but there, there were a number of open marriages that I have came to know after doing what I do. There have been several people who have escaped the message who have told me. In fact, one person, one lady in particular, she joked that our church was like the church where you put your keys in the jar. That's it was so <laughs> it was so commonly done, and I'm like, wait a minute, which which church was that? And they uh, they partied a lot more than our church. I, we were in the Branham Tabernacle. We were known as the Church of the Wax <laughs> the Wax Museum because everybody dresses <laughs> alike, they talk alike, and here's this mm -hmm. church where you put your keys in the jar. And to the message people who don't know what this means, you grab the set of it's a thing you do at a bar. You grab somebody else's set of keys and that's who you go home with <clears throat> but that was a that was a joke that was made early on when i first started doing my website and i didn't believe it and then i heard another and another and i'm like the, the, there's something wrong here and you can't really say that all of this you know if, if you're in the the cult and you hear this you're going to think well that's just an odd case that's that's just that's that's this person's fault you know the the husband should have never done this which is true but there was a framework of missteps that would have never happened outside of the cult. There would never be the situation in a normal church where the female is the one who is always at fault. 
That was mistake number one. Then mistake number two, you go to a pastor for help. That's who you're going to see for help. Any normal church, they're going to say, well, it sounds like you're in a bad situation. You need counseling and be careful because there may be something wrong with this man. Watch yourself. If there is a problem, you need to get out of it quickly. That's a normal church. There's the, so there's a series of missteps that would have never happened, you know, outside of the cult. I'm curious, you know, after having gone through that, if you could look back and talk to your younger self and say something to your younger self to give encouragement or help, what would you say? So I'm, <clears throat> I'm of course, in therapy now. Um, um, I would look at her and say, you know what? You weren't doing anything wrong. You weren't doing anything wrong. You were you were doing the best that you could with the knowledge that you had at the time, and you weren't the one making the wrong steps. You were just a girl, and you fell in love with the wrong boy and didn't have a way out. And I tell myself this a lot, um, that I wish I would have, I wish I would have told him that I wasn't going through with the wedding the day he came to me um, about my wedding dress. But then I wouldn't have my children. And um, there's a lot of a lot of things that that got me to where I am now, um, and I wouldn't be who I was now if I didn't have to go through what I did. Am yeah. I? Am I glad that I went through it? No, I, I hate that I had to go through it. Um, I have a lot of feelings about what I had to go through. Um, I, uh, <laughs> funny enough, um, my pastor here in Alabama wasn't the only pastor to tell me that. So, so you went to multiple pastors for help, and they weren't able to help you. I did. Um, I went to um, another pastor. Um, uh, I, I actually called him on the phone. I, I had left. There had been another big fight, and I left. I left my kids at the house and my ex-husband at the house, and I, and I left. I went to a hotel room, and I was told to either get my attitude right or don't come back. Um, and I had a journal and I, and I called, I called this pastor and I spoke to him and I asked him, I said, I know that, that you're not my pastor. I said, I know you know me and I know you know my husband and, and this is, this is my, has been my life and I don't know what to do. And I was told the same thing. I was told to continue to pray and, and get my life right. And if I got my life right, then everything would turn out right again. Uh, so I was told the exact same exact same words exact same the only difference is he he didn't have he didn't have his daughter you know call me later of course he didn't have a daughter but um <laughs> he didn't have anyone call me later to counsel me about my problems so he didn't talk to anybody else about it which i do appreciate um uh, but i i wrote i wrote down some things in a journal and and um um i found that journal um, after um, my eventual separation, which has only my divorce will be final, um, will have been final for a year on February 1st. So, um, you know, even after I left the church, um, it was it was after that time that I, I just, I never did go back to church after, after that point. Um, I was maybe 30, 31. I started wearing jeans. I cut my hair. First time I cut my hair, um, I had separated from from him um, and gone to my parents for a couple uh, for a couple weeks. I'd taken the kids, and during that time, I cut my hair. Um, and he told his mom that I cut my hair, and I bet you can guess what her response was. <laughs> you have a reason to divorce her now because she cut her hair. I'm sure this story is hard for our listeners, but it's also doubly hard for me because I know some of the people you're talking about personally. <clears throat> and the the thing about cutting your hair, it's so unbiblical 
that that this is even a thing. And it was said, thus saith the Lord, you can put your wife away if she cuts her hair. But again, yeah. <clears throat> it goes back to that same framework, right? It's the woman's fault. She did this thing. Now you can get rid of her. In other words, she's less to you than a pair of scissors. The, the thing is, it wasn't just indoctrinated into the men. It was indoctrinated into me that I was the problem and that I had to continue to work on myself to fix this problem. And I believed it for so long. Um, but after I cut my hair and, and he said that, um, he, he talked me into coming back. And I told him I would under, under one of two conditions. Either um, I'm going to either get a job I love because being a stay-at-home mom is not working for me. I'm not going to just stay home and take care of your house and take care of you. I'm just not, that's not going to happen anymore. It's not who I am. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to church. I'm no longer going to wear dresses and I'll do whatever I want with my hair. <laughs> um, or I'm going to go back to school. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to go to school and, and get a degree in some way. And he agreed. He agreed that if I come back and bring the kids back, that all of those things would be okay. I could either get a job or, or, or go to school. Um, and this is the beginning of, of where my life changed um, and the happy part. And uh, <laughs> um, I was waiting for us to end on a happy note. <laughs> yeah, so we're going to end up on a happy note. Um, so we get, we get back and, and I decide that I want to go to nursing school. And he's like, okay, when do you want to go? And I said, I don't know. I'm going to start looking. And so I start doing the research and I, and I get ready and I said, okay, I can sign up and start classes on this date. And he's like, oh, but, but our daughter's only, um, she, she's, she's not quite in school yet. Can you wait till she goes to school? And I'm like, that's not what you promised me. That's not what you told me. And I said, but I will wait and go to the next, the next time to sign up. Um, and that was, that had been in August and the next enrollment was, was in January. Well, actually, you, you enrolled in December and you went to school in January. And uh, he was at work and I called my um, sister-in-law and I said, hey, you want to go enroll in classes with me? <laughs> and she's like, she's like, yeah, let's do this. And um, um, I, I need to put that back. Uh, uh, my ex-husband's oldest brother and my sister-in-law were very supportive of me during the entire time that... I was going through the really rough time in my marriage. They knew everything. They knew every bit of it. And my, my brother-in-law did try to speak with my husband about his actions and it didn't do any good. Um, I do, I do want to put that out there because, because I love them to death and they are, they are, they are wonderful people. And I don't want anyone to think that, that I was completely alone because I wasn't because they helped me in so many ways. But anyway, so she goes, uh, yeah, let's go. So we went up to the school and um, I signed up for classes. But what I didn't realize is that um, this is how much I didn't know. At 30 years old, I didn't know that I had to, um, I had to actually pay for the classes immediately <laughs> when you enroll. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so I called him at work and I said, I am, I'm here at the the college and I've signed up for classes and I need your credit card. And he's like, what? And I repeated myself. I said, I'm here and I need your credit card because I'm signing up for classes. And he's like, he's like, but I thought you were going to wait. And I said, I did wait. This is me waiting. And this is me now starting. And he gave me his credit card and I went to nursing school. Um, and, uh, that was my, that was my, the beginning of my way out. Um, it seemed like after I went to nursing school and um, I was really good at it. Um, and our, our kids were raised. There were still fights. There were still problems. There were still issues. But there was a little bit of respect that me having a backbone and saying, this is what's happening. This is what I'm doing, regardless of what you say. You can either get with the program or I can do this on my own without you. And that was basically what I told him. Um, Things got better. The fighting got less. The the problems got less. Um, throughout this entire thing, we still had the open marriage thing, but it it was it was different. It was I didn't have the guilt that I the, I didn't have the guilt from you know partying and then going to going to church. Um, and then you know. <sighs> 
things got a lot better. You know, we, we, we had money. Um, and I kind of felt like, well, this, this, this is okay. I can live this life. Right. And, um, then in this, um, open marriage thing, I, I met someone who convinced me differently that this wasn't going to work. And, and my ex-husband went, he went insane. He, he, um, started back with the, the, the mental and the physical abuse and, um, he he threatened to commit suicide if I continued on the path that I was going. And so I went to him and I said, I don't want you to touch me ever again. And I want you, because at the time I was doing travel nursing. So we were in, we were in Oregon. We still had the house here in Alabama. Um, and I told him, I said, go home to Alabama. I don't want to see you again. And, um, Within six months, we had the divorce paper signed, and within, you know, within a month after that, <clears throat> the divorce was was um was final. And the end of this month, it'll have been a year that we've been divorced, and I'm still with that friend that I met that made me see that life can be different. And I'm still nursing, and a lot happier than I ever will be, and. When my, um, when my sister showed me your Facebook page, I didn't realize, I knew there's a lot of deconstructing of my, of my marriage that, that I still had to do. And I'm in therapy for that and it's going well. Um, highly recommend therapy. You know, just, just because we were in the message doesn't mean we can't have therapy now. <laughs> um, and uh, I didn't realize how much deconstructing of what part the message had in my marriage that I still have to do. Um, the part that it played in, in kind of molding me as to who I am now. Um, uh, there's a lot of that that I still have to deal with. And part of that is telling the story to you today. It's a lot of weight to carry. Um, you know, as a male, I have nothing even close to as hard as what you went through, but there are these mental, there's this mental baggage that you carry just from being in the religion and escaping. Then you have that mental baggage. And then if you're in a situation like, like you had and many others share the same, not the same, but very similar stories, they've got that baggage on top of <laughs> the cold baggage which is a burden that is really hard to bear without therapy. So I too recommend therapy if you've gone through it. Um, <clears throat> what would you say to encourage people? Like I said, there's, there are people who maybe not as bad, but they share similar stories, especially with regards to the abuse. And what would you say to the people who are right now going through this process of escaping and now they're healing and, some of them are in therapy. Some of them are a little bit scared to go because that's how they've been indoctrinated. What would you say to encourage somebody who has escaped? If it feels wrong, get out. You can decide later whether it really was or wasn't. But if it feels wrong, listen. Um, if it feels like, and, and, and that's whether it's, it's <clears throat> you're trying to escape the church whether you're trying to escape a marriage, whether you're trying to escape whatever it is you're trying to escape from at this moment, if it feels wrong, it probably is. Um, get out and get yourself to a place of safety. And once you get to that place of safety, the clarity that you will see from your situation will be astounding. The amount of, of, of opening, once you have some distance, from that, when you when you stop going to church and you have some distance from from not being in that constantly, you know, every you know three times a week or you know every day having to read your Bible or every day listening to a tape. Um, once you have distanced yourself from that, the mental fog lifts, and you can see that there's a lot wrong with the entire thing. And be gentle with yourself. And it's okay to be angry. It's okay to be mad. It's okay to have some resentment. Just don't let it change who you are inside. 
Well, I'm so glad that you came to share your story with everybody, and I'm certain our listeners are going to find a lot of encouragement, and some some will find some some help for some of the situations they're going through just by hearing another person who has overcame. So if you've enjoyed our show and you want more information, you can check us out on the web. You can find us at william-branham.org. For an overview of the historical research of William Branham and the Healing Revivals, read Preacher Behind the White Hoods, A Critical Examination of William Branham and His Message, available on Amazon, Kindle, and Audible.